Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. All right, today we're doing something different. I am talking about how I plan to vote on November 5th on election day. I have been very critical of Kamala Harris and her extreme pro-abortion platform. As you guys know, I have also been critical of many of the pro-abortion positions that President Trump has taken, especially in the last few months. We have done many episodes on this. We've also wrestled with the question of how to vote when both candidates support abortion to varying degrees. What does that mean for the pro-life voter? And so after a lot of prayer and thought and wrestling with this for weeks, and I will say hoping and praying that President Trump particularly would change course on this because he has indicated some movement in the past. So I've been hoping, you know, we're up until really the final hour here that he would change. And there have been some concessions, which we're gonna talk about here and I'm gonna share. This is an essay that I have published to X and to social media, and I wanted to share that essay with you guys now. The essay is titled, What's a Pro-Life Voter to Do? I have publicly opposed both Donald Trump and Kamala Harris's positions on abortion over the last few months. I have been asked repeatedly over the last few days by media, allies, and friends who I will be voting for on November 5th, or if I'm planning to just sit it out. This essay explains the thought process behind both my public opposition to the candidates' positions the difference between their positions and my vote. For many, including myself, the single most important issue to consider when deciding who to vote for is the candidate's position on basic human rights, particularly the right to life. Human life is sacred and every human possesses the right to life starting in the womb. Abortion, the intentional destruction of a preborn child, is the leading cause of death in America, killing 3,000 children daily. When both of the two main political parties have hostile anti life policies, what is a pro life voter supposed to do? Let's start with Kamala Harris's positions and why I believe no pro life voter should cast their vote for her. As Attorney General of California, Kamala Harris selectively prosecuted pro-life journalists who exposed Planned Parenthood selling baby body parts, which is a federal crime. At the time, Kamala Harris was also accepting money for her then-Senate campaign from Planned Parenthood. Harris also used her power as attorney general to attempt to force pro-life pregnancy center nonprofits to post abortion advertisements in their clinics. Harris has said that if she were president, she would pass federal legislation codifying Roe v. Wade, which would legalize abortion on demand without restriction through all nine months of pregnancy. This would supersede all life-saving laws at the state level. Kamala Harris opposes conscience protections for healthcare professionals, meaning she would force, if she had the power and the ability, she would force healthcare professionals and hospitals to commit abortions or else lose their ability to practice medicine. Disturbingly, Harris has made unfettered support for abortion a central tenet for her entire presidential campaign. She's also been the first candidate for U.S. president to tour an abortion clinic as a publicity stunt. Harris's campaign has also spread massive amounts of misinformation about abortion, claiming that miscarriage treatments are being banned in pro-life states. They're not. And blaming abortion-related deaths, like Amber Thurman, who took the abortion pill, on pro-life laws. The recurring message in nearly every interview and speech that Kamala Harris gives centers on her unflinching support for abortion. And this has only intensified as her campaign has gone on. If fascism is the alignment of all power to the state, Kamala Harris is a model abortion fascist. Harris's campaign is the most pro-abortion campaign in American history. She not only stands against the rights of preborn children, but she actively works to thwart the rights of pro-life Americans, including conservatives and Christians, to advocate for these children. Let's talk about the Republican side. For over 40 years, the Republican Party platform included the right to life. But in an apparent effort to court swing voters and so-called moderates, President Trump's allies gutted the Republican Party platform on life and marriage. What his campaign has chosen instead is a path that prioritizes supposed political convenience over fundamental human rights. Several weeks ago, J.D. Vance said that he and Trump support access to abortion pills which account for 60% of all abortions. 
Nearly 2,000 children a day are killed by abortion pills, and one out of every 25 women who use abortion pills will end up in the hospital with complications caused by them. They are dangerous for women and deadly for the children that they kill. Trump has also announced his support for taxpayer-funded IVF. In addition to being incredibly expensive, anywhere from $30,000 to $60,000 per live birth, IVF is incredibly risky for women. And for every IVF-created human embryo that survives to the point he or she can be implanted, many of his or her embryonic siblings are callously discarded for their perceived imperfections. Of the human embryos that do survive this harvesting, millions end up indefinitely frozen, suspended in a cruel limbo, waiting to either become convenient enough to be given the chance to live and grow or to die like their many siblings. IVF commodifies children, turning them into property to be created, used, or destroyed at will. Trump and Vance have also expressed support for abortion exceptions for rape and incest and oppose a national abortion ban. They say that abortion should be an issue left to the states, and Trump has criticized and undermined pro-life state laws, such as Florida's heartbeat law. Trump and Vance may believe that these positions are politically more expedient. I've had many people tell me, Lila, they're just trying to win an election. But there is no middle ground when it comes to life. Every child, no matter how he or she is conceived, has a right to be given a chance at life. And they don't have a voice, but we do. Every abortion intends to end the life of a child. Either there is a right to life or there isn't. Abortion is not a state's rights issue. Abortion is a human rights issue, and it is already unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment which declares that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process. To his permanent credit, Trump historically appointed three of the Supreme Court justices who helped overturn Roe v. Wade, the poorly decided Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion on demand nationally. The overturn of Roe was a tremendous milestone for the pro-life movement. But overruling Roe is only meaningful if laws are passed that protect preborn children at all stages of development. For Trump to oppose many of these pro life laws when it was his judicial appointments that paved the way for them is a tragedy and a massively wasted opportunity. As you guys know, I have repeatedly voiced opposition to the recent changes in the Republican platform and in the positions taken by Trump and Vance, urging them to change course. Two months ago, after J.D. Vance first announced on national television that he and Trump supported access for abortion pills and that Trump would veto a national abortion ban, I publicly stated, if you don't stand for pro-life principles, you don't get pro-life votes. I helped lead a mounting pressure campaign against the Trump campaign to urge them to change course. At the time, I also had the opportunity to meet privately with President Trump. He was generous with his time, and we spoke for two hours on my disagreements with him on abortion. Some progress was made. When enough pro-life allies expressed outrage and threatened to withhold their votes, Trump reversed his position on Amendment 4 which would legalize abortion through all nine months in his home state of Florida, and he expressed his opposition to it. Here's the reality. Kamala Harris's policies and record on abortion are objectively worse than Trump's. If Trump does not win on November 5th, it will be Kamala Harris who will assume the presidency. We are at the final hour. I will be voting for Donald Trump on November 5th. The prospect of what Kamala Harris may do in the next four years as president is worse than what Trump has said he would do and could be worse than the negative influence that Trump may have long term on the Republican Party if he wins this election. I think it is essential that for those who choose to vote for Trump in order to stave off the evils that the Harris administration brings, that they voice their opposition to any anti-life policies that Trump may support. I am deeply concerned for the future of the Republican Party, which looks increasingly like the Democrat Party on life and marriage. When both parties go increasingly towards anti-life, anti-marriage positions, where does that leave millions of Americans who stand for life and marriage? I have repeatedly said that Trump's new positions on abortion and IVF have discouraged pro-life voters. There will be many voters who choose the less pro-abortion candidate, like myself, and vote for Donald Trump reluctantly over Kamala Harris. 
But there will also be voters who have become so discouraged by Trump's positions that they may decide to sit this election out. I urge Republicans to think big picture about this and restore life to their platform and advocacy. If they don't, the Republican Party will not be able to depend on social conservatives and Christians for their votes in the future. Enthusiasm will fade, and voter turnout will suffer even more than it does today. I urge the Democrat Party to change as well, and to reject the pro-abortion influence that has a stranglehold on its future. In addition, for voters in 10 states this election, there are also abortion amendments on their state ballots. So as we celebrate the fall of the Roe regime, we must also turn our attention to protecting life at the state level. It is crucial for voters to reject these abortion amendments. In particular, I want to urge those in Missouri to vote no on Amendment 3, which would legalize abortion up until birth. It is possible to win in Missouri. Vote no on Amendment 3. And for my friends in Florida, vote no on Amendment 4, which would legalize abortion up until the moment of birth. Live Action Victory, a new 501c4 that I founded, has a full voting guide for state initiatives. It is linked in the description. I encourage everyone to read this guide and to vote to protect children's lives. We must continue our fight to secure the respect for human life in both political parties and across our culture. The protection of our children cannot be negotiable. America's future depends on leaders who protect its most vulnerable. Also, I will be doing a live YouTube event on Monday with people like Father Mike Schmitz, Al Mahler, Bishop Burbage, Lisa Bevere, and many other friends and allies. We will be praying together for mercy on this country and for God's conversion in our hearts and across the nation. Please join me for prayer on Monday, November 4th, and keep your eye on the channel and on the live action channel for updates to join this live prayer event. Thank you guys so much for listening as I share my thoughts. I know this is highly controversial. I know that there are a lot of opinions and beliefs and concerns about this. And I wanna urge you on November 5th to go out and vote your conscience and to vote for life. Thank you guys so much. God bless you guys. And we'll see you next time.